So with that in mind, I want you to know God's got a big picture. Amen. God is doing something on this earth. He has a plan. He's in control and he's moving forward with it. Let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 13. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to. To stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I did not put this in my notes. I'm not going to be preaching on verse 11 specifically. But I just want to explain a little bit to you about what's being said right here to begin with. He's saying to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I need you to know that part of what this... uh, Actually, the word, uh, finally, my brethren, be strong. This word, if I was going to write for you... On the board, the word in the Greek is in dynamo. Now, this is this is a, a, a compound word in the Greek language. There's prefixes and suffixes that are connected to root words. Two words right here. Number one, the first word is where we get the word in do. And the second word is where we get the word dynamite. Now. Really and truly, this word dynamo was in existence. I don't mean to get too deep on you, but was in existence long before the word dynamite was. And so what it really describes is inner strength or an inherent strength. It's, but it's on the inside is the point that I want to make. It's not your strength that's on the inside of you. No, speaking to the Christian, it's a strength that's placed on the inside of you. And the word in do means to be clothed upon. It means that it's given to you. But what the word of the Lord is saying right here is, is that finally, my brethren, understand that you've been endued with power that you were given through the Holy Spirit when you got saved and the presence of God came to live on the inside of you. You have an inner strength in you. It's a strength from God that he wants to empower you in order to accomplish his will upon this earth. But then he says in verse 11, now you need to put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, let me just take a second right here. I'm not going to preach and I'm not even going to teach on the armor of God this morning. I've done that multiple times. But what I am going to do, I'm not going to tell you exactly. I'm going to try to tell you quickly what it is, but I'm definitely going to tell you what it's not. Putting on the whole armor of God is not you and I waking up every morning and going through some ritualistic process where we slowly begin to put on the armor of God. No, putting on the armor of God is understanding this simple thought. Jesus has already accomplished and won the victory in the spiritual realm. And now you and I, by faith, put that on each and every day. That's how we begin to walk through faith understanding that Jesus has already accomplished the will of the Father, that Jesus has already defeated the forces of evil. And I put that on through faith, saying, Jesus, what you did was enough. I'm going to walk in that today and do me with power from on high. Let your inner strength work in me and allow it to work through me. And the reason that you need that to happen is, look, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles, trickery, cunning, deceit. The enemy that is opposed to you, the enemy that is opposed to God, is deceitful and he operates with trickery and he allows himself to be manifested. Even the Apostle Paul told us that when in the letter to the Corinthians as an angel of light. The enemy will manifest himself and present himself as an angel of light to bring deception and trickery. But the Lord wants you and I to be ready and to be strengthened. Now I want you to go to verse, we're going to go to verse 12 right here. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's very important. I want you to remember what we're talking about here. We're in a wrestling match. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, In high places. Verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all. To stand. The first thing that I want you to know about this passage of scripture. uh, Was in the word wrestling. Right there in verse 12. 
the, the word wrestling right there in, in the concept of what it was taken from in the ancient Greek culture was that two men, and it's not that uncommon to what we might would see in a modern MMA match nowadays, where they, they were grappling with one another. And the goal, the ultimate goal in the wrestling match was that one opponent got his other opponent prostrate on the ground and had him in a position of submission. They would call that in jujitsu the mount. Had mounted him and had his hand upon his neck, basically, basically like a chokehold, and had him in submission until ultimately he came out victorious and the other one could not win the match. That is what's being described here, but it's going on in the spiritual realm. Now the end result was that the person who lost and was defeated literally would have his eyes gouged out. That was the end result of losing a battle in the ancient Greek whenever they were in the midst of these types of wrestling matches. But what the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is telling us is that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, we are to understand where to place our faith. Therefore, we are to understand where we receive our strength from so that we might be able to stand against the evil opposition. So these forces of evil are presented in the word of God as an opponent trying to gain victory over the life of the believer. If Satan gains the spiritual victory in the believer's life, he now finds himself bound underneath the power of evil and unable to see spiritually. Just like the ancient Greek wrestler lost his eyes, his eyes have been gouged out, he no longer will be able to see the believer in the spiritual realm. If he allows the enemy to get the upper hand, a stronghold placed in his life, he will find himself in a position where he is paralyzed, prostrate. He cannot get up, and the enemy has control in his life, and he now is no longer able to see spiritually. But God's plan for the believer is that we would have the victory, amen? And he, that we would be able to stand against the forces of evil. Now, I'm talking right now in this part of my message right here about your personal, about my personal life. And I want us to understand that the context that surrounds this is, is right subsequent or right after chapter five in Ephesians. Chapter five and the first nine verses of chapter six. And you can go back and you can, if you're taking notes, you can go back and you can read it for yourself, chapter 5, first nine verses of chapter 6. But let me just give you a quick rundown of what was talking about. For believers, that they were to walk out their lives in a different way than they had before. That they weren't to live their lives the way that they had in the past. That they should not engage in sexual immorality. That their thought life should be pure. That it's wrong to speak about people in a way that will tear them down and is just brushed aside as a little joke. Christians must submit to one another as we all submit to the Lord. In other words, I can't just do what I want because my choices affect you also. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives sacrificially. Children, obey your parents. Parents, don't provoke. Workers, Work like you're working for Jesus. Bosses, don't be harsh and threaten your workers because you also have to answer to Jesus. See, this letter is written to Christians. And one of the things that I begin to realize is as we're talking about the fact that we're wrestling against not flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. We begin to understand that when we struggle with immorality or even improper thoughts. It's a spiritual struggle. When we struggle with treating people, when, we're, when, when we know in our heart we're supposed to be kind and respectful, but instead we, it makes us feel good to laugh at somebody else's shortcomings, guess what? That's a spiritual struggle. You might not see it that way. You might think it's just all a little bit of fun, but I'm here to tell you that the Lord is opposed to it. His word is opposed to it. When we can't treat our spouse, our children, other Christians, or the people that we work with properly, it's a spiritual struggle. If we really stop and consider the majority of the frustrations that we face in life, we will always come to the conclusion that most of those frustrations are related to the people that we encounter on a daily basis. Just stop for a second. 
Think about the things that you're going through right now. The last thing that frustrated you. More than likely, in some way, shape, or form, it's either something that you made a choice for yourself or some way, shape, or form, some interaction that you have with another human being. Whether it was somebody you worked with, whether it was somebody you have a relationship with, whether it was one of your children, whatever it may be, it was usually a, a relationship situation. But the text is teaching us that there's a bigger, bigger battle that we must be aware of and prepared for. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Your battle is not with your boss, your spouse, your child, your friend. Your battle is with Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And the results of what you feel on earth through these human interactions are ultimately generated through sin and evil manipulating and operating through people. So whenever somebody does something wrong to you, quit getting so frustrated and angry with that particular person. Realize that it's the enemy working through that person. And let me tell you something, brother and sister. It's not just them that he's working through. He also works through us. Even us who feel as though we've arrived. The enemy will use us also as vessels to bring frustration in other people's lives. Because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure we have all of us, none of us have really arrived yet. That's why even the Apostle Paul said, I have not yet apprehended, yet I press on toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. It's important for us all to understand that it's not just them, but that many times it's also us. And instead of realizing what's really at play here, we get irritated with the person. And we want to lash out at them. And we demand that they act right. I don't know about you, but I do that a lot. I'm like, I, in my heart anyway. I may not say it with my mouth, but in my heart, I'm like, you need to act right. And then when they do it again, we just keep getting more and more frustrated. We're expecting them to do something different. And the reality of it is, is that until God changes their heart, they're going to keep doing the same thing. Until God changes our heart in one of these areas where we're struggling, mm -hmm. we're going to keep doing the same thing. But see, your battle isn't with them. You're wrestling with spiritual forces, but good news, God has equipped you for the battle. He said, be strong in the Lord and put on the armor of God. Once again, to be strong means in dynamo, it means that you've been endued, it means that you have an inherent strength on the inside of you, but it's not your own strength. See, that's the, that would be the lie of new age. Oh, you have a strength on the inside of you. It, it, you know, no, if I got anything good on the inside of me, it's because I bowed my knee to Jesus, and whenever I said yes to the Lord, the Holy Spirit made my heart his home, and that's what's good in me, and if that does, if that does not sit right with your spirit, then you hopped upon the wrong channel and you need to change it and go find a different one. Because I'm here to tell you this morning that there ain't nothing good in us unless Jesus is in us. The word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah said the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? That means that you don't even know your own heart. I don't even know my own heart. The apostle Paul even admitted that just because he doesn't feel as though there's something wrong in his moral conscience, it doesn't make him right. But that one day the Lord was going to judge all the motives of everything that we've done. The main idea in all of this is that the battle has been won. Amen? I want you to know that. If you don't get anything else out of this this morning, and however far we go with this, I'm here to tell you that this is what the whole message is about. That the enemy is real. He, we're in the midst of a battle. But I'm here to tell you that God has already won. Game over. And it's for time for you and I to begin to trust that and to begin to believe that. It's the believer's responsibility to put God's victory in the battle. And allow him to win. God is a winner. Amen. Did you realize that? God is a winner and God has already won. And so the only question left to ask is, will we let him win again today? Will we let him win again each day in our lives? The power of God is available to the believer based on a spiritual transaction. Let's take a look at some scripture real quick. Look at. Colossians with, with, with me, if you will. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. I use this scripture a lot because 
I can remember a long, long time ago, Robert and I were doing a Bible study in Homa. And I can remember that I was explaining to these men that, listen, Jesus didn't just die on the cross so that you could be saved. But Jesus died on the cross so that you can have victory today. Yeah. I made a comment that Jesus died on the cross. And when he did, he defeated the powers of darkness. And I can remember one of them saying, do you have scripture for that? And this was the scripture that the Lord gave me. There's no scripture that explains in one short section <clears throat> the concept of the cross and its connection to your victory today, at least in my opinion, better than this one does on the surface right here. Let's take a look at it. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 and I'm going to break it down a little bit. It says blotting out <clears throat> the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What he's talking about when he says handwriting of ordinances, he's talking about the law of Moses. What I need you to understand is that the law of Moses has called each and every human being that has ever walked on the earth guilty. Because according to God's law, if you can't keep the whole law, then you failed in all of the law. So the law basically was saying that you and I were all guilty. Because in some way, shape, or form, we've all stolen. We've We've all lied. We've all done done things that were improper according to the word of the Lord. And even if we kept all nine, if we failed in the tenth, then we failed in all. That's what the word of the Lord would say. So he took that law that was against us, that was contrary to us. The reason it was against us and contrary is because it called us guilty. And he took it out of the way. How did he do that? Well, this is how he did it. By nailing it. To his cross. What that means is this. Is that the law called all man guilty. That means all mankind was in sin. And the Bible teaches that the wages of sin. Romans 6.23. Is death. And Jesus had no sin. And Jesus kept the law. To its perfect fulfillment. In the eyes of the father. Maybe not to the eyes of the religious people. I don't have time to get into all that. On how Jesus broke the Sabbath in their eyes, but they had already added their own laws. And that's what man does. He thinks he's more holy than God's word. And he starts adding all his own stuff. We don't have time to get into that, but let me just say this. In the eyes of God and according to the word of God, Jesus kept the law of God to its perfection. Then he offered that sinless life that he had, brought, that he had on the cross and he paid the wage of sin. He paid the sin debt. When he died and by because he had no sin, he was paying the sin debt, not for himself, but for you and I. That's why death couldn't hold him down. Amen. And that's why he resurrected from the dead. But I'm just trying to explain to you. That's how Jesus handled this problem with the law that we have. We're talking about this transaction right now, how Jesus won the victory for us and how he has given us victory each and every day. Now. How did he win the victory over the law? How did he remove the law from our life that called us guilty? He removed it by nailing it with him to his cross. Look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers. What that means is, is to take the victory. Jesus took the victory from those very principalities and powers that you are in a wrestling match with. He took he spoiled the principalities and powers and he made a show of them openly and he triumphed over them in it. What is it? Well, I teach it all the time. It goes right back to the cross. This verse 15 of Colossians chapter 2 teaches you and I that even though there are fallen angels, even though there are demon spirits, and even though these spiritual entities are trying to cause us to live our lives in such a way that it would not bring glory to God, that Jesus paid the penalty for sin, and whenever he did that, he won the victory for you and I, and hallelujah, I want you to, I got some other good news. He's also given you and I access to that victory. That's my next scripture. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. I want you to see that God, through your salvation, through your faith in Christ, God allowed you to be translated. Amen. He took you out of one place and he put you in another. Look what it says. Who, he's talking about Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness. 
Did you know that the reason why you kept doing what you knew you weren't supposed to be doing was because you were under the power of darkness. You were under the bondage of the enemy. The enemy held you in a prison. But I got good news. You don't have to live there anymore. Oh, but I've been trying, preacher. I've been listening to what you're saying. You and I both have areas of our life that the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to us. And yet we still don't want to completely surrender certain areas of our life. It's not a problem. Listen, first off, we got to understand where to put our faith. I'm here to tell you this morning. And it's a simple message. Put your faith. Keep your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. When you keep your faith there, you're clothed in righteousness. As you're clothed in righteousness, you now are prepared to receive a flow of grace from the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to do the work in your life. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to set you free. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to make you not want to talk bad about that girl anymore. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to make you want to treat the people that you love the right way. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to make you want to quit lying and cheating and stealing. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to set you free from addictions upon this earth. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to set you free from the wiles and the trickery and the deceit of Satan. It's the Holy Spirit working through the fact that you're clothed in the armor of God seated in Christ in heavenly places because of your simple faith in the beautiful plan of God. And when you did that, on the day that you did that, whether you knew it or not, it's right here in the Bible, he has delivered you from the power of darkness and he has translated you into a new kingdom, hallelujah, into a new kingdom, the new kingdom of his dear son. And look at this, it's all about the cross, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That means that you were guilty, but he bought you back through the shedding of his blood. Through the shedding of his blood, he was able to remove you from the kingdom of darkness and its power and to bring you into the kingdom of the dear son. And there's no power of darkness in that place. Instead, it's the power of the Holy Spirit moving and operating in the citizens of that kingdom. God won. Through Jesus, God won the victory for us and whatever we face on a daily basis, whether it's struggles in our personal relationships at home or at work or struggles in our thought life or problems with addictions or whatever it is, God has already won. And the way that we allow him to continue winning in our lives every day is through faith. Amen. We believe that what he gave us is enough to not only save us, but heal us and give us victory. Well, what did he give us? What did God the Father give us. I'm going to tell you right here. It's John chapter 3. It's the most popular scripture in the Bible. This is what he gave you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But I got to tell you something. Jesus didn't just come to give us life for the future. He came to give us abundant life today. Look at John chapter 10. Verse 10, Jesus came to give you abundant life today. Amen. The thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. Every day the thief has a plan to rob your joy. He wants to steal, kill and destroy from you. But Jesus has come to give you abundant life. You know what that word abundant means? Beyond what is needed. God has provided everything for you and I beyond what you need. There's a super, there's an overabundance of grace. There's an overabundance of the power of the Holy Spirit. There's an overabundance of God's mercy. Whatever it is that you're facing today, I'm here to tell you that there's an overabundance of God's will waiting for you if you and I would just surrender to him. Through Jesus' sacrifice and your willingness to believe God in his word, that your faith in Jesus and his sacrifice put you in right standing with God. A flow of grace is released from the person of the Holy Spirit and he will begin to heal and to set free. Now, real quick, I want to share this particular scripture, Psalm chapter 37, verse 5 with you. This is what the scripture says, because see, this is the problem that I believe that we have many times, even when we begin to understand the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, the new covenant, the cross, the, the gospel, the Bible, like I said, whatever you want to call it. 
It's the scriptures. It's the will of God. We, even once we begin by the grace of God to have our eyes enlightened to the truth of God, many times we still question and wonder why there seems to be a disconnect. And I just said it earlier, but I'm going to say it again. It's because many times there's things that we just, we're not ready to surrender. We like them too much. Whatever those things may be. We like certain mindsets. We like certain things the way that we like them. And even though the Lord's speaking to us, we're holding on to them. Look what this scripture says. Commit your way unto the Lord. There's a right way and a wrong way to do things. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And then he shall bring it to pass. Whatever it is that you need in your life, if you will commit your way to the Lord, he's the one that's going to cause it to come to pass. You're not going to manipulate, especially if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you need to just give your heart to Jesus right now. Amen. Lord, come into my heart and save me. But if you are a Christian and you are tuning in to learn more about God, what I'm here to tell you this morning is this, is that you have to commit your ways unto the Lord, not just you, but me. Now, one of the interesting things was I looked this word commit up this morning and I didn't realize this, but what the word means, it means to roll away. I imagine in my mind, if I had a ball in my hand and there was a little child sitting, now God's not a child. I'm just trying to use this illustration. And I had a ball in my hand and this ball represented my way. Everything that Matt was, all the areas of Matt's life that the Lord was saying, I need you to let go of that, Matt, and I need you to give it to me. It's all contained right here. And it would be as though what I did was I rolled it away. Oops. I rolled it away. I rolled it away and I gave it to God. Here you go, Lord. Let me roll this away from me and give it to you. That's what the word means. To commit it, to roll it away, to give it to the Lord. And when we are willing to do that, to give it to God, to release it out of our hand and to put it in his hand, then the word of the Lord says that as we do that and we're trusting him with every aspect of our life, that he shall bring it to pass. So the word commit literally means to roll away. Imagine you have that ball in your hand and you're releasing all those desires of yourself. It would sound something like this. I don't want to invite that girl I work with to ride with us to the conference. I know she's a Christian, but she's lame. And I'd rather hang out with the cool girls at work and ride with them. That is un inappropriate. You're a Christian. She's a Christian. Your carnal mindset is still based upon what you learn from the world. You're supposed to die to that. Right. The Lord doesn't want you to, to think that way about fellow believers. You're either, you got a problem in your heart, sister, if that's you. As a matter of fact, when I get in the car and we're riding to the conference, I think I can make everybody laugh when I talk about that new hair thing she has going on. What I'm here to tell you about is this. That's a problem. That's called coarse jesting. When you make fun of someone else at their expense, the Lord is displeased with that. Modern day culture calls it roasting. I oh, believe me. I know. I got young people that come in. I see them all the time at the clinic. It's always been called roasting. They used to have the Dean Martin roast. That's what they would do. They'd put the star up there and everybody would just pound them with all of this verbal assault and everybody just laughing and laughing. Well, nowadays the kids have taken the word. They've made it. They brought it back around and it's called the roasting. Let's have a roasting session and we just clown people, clown people, clown people. We dog them. We tear them down. And it's all in good fun. It's all in good humor. It's against the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says it's not funny when you tear other people down only so that you can get a good laugh out of it. I don't want to submit to my husband. I don't want to love my wife. And I will provoke my children if I want to. And I don't have to do what my boss wants me to do when he's not looking. Or I will treat my employees harshly if I want to. After all, it is my business. No, you're not rolling it away, Christian. The word of the Lord says you're supposed to live your life a certain way. And, you're, and when you see that there's things in your life that are contrary to the word of the Lord, you're supposed to give them to God. And then when you give them to God, guess what will happen? He will allow that release of grace that's already been purchased by Jesus at Calvary to flow into your life. He will cause that thing that is wrong and contrary to the word of God to begin to wither and to die. Hallelujah. And he will cause a new 
that new branch to spring up, which is Christ, the love of Christ in you, as the Holy Spirit flows through it and the fruit of the Spirit will begin to be produced in the midst of your life. Hallelujah. Now I want to change gears on you a little bit. I'm about to actually about to close, but I'm going to introduce a new concept to you and we'll finish it up when we can. All right. Because I told you in the beginning of my message about the big picture. God wants you to know that he doesn't only have a plan for you and for me to fix us up, but he's got a big old plan going on. And just as the enemy is wrestling against you personally to try to destroy you to steal your life. The enemy is also trying to destroy the will and the plan of God for the earth. I want to remind you that you're not the only one in a battle here. There is still a war raging that God is fighting on this earth. Satan is still trying not only to kill, steal, and destroy from you, but he also wants to steal, kill, and destroy from God. And you say in your heart, well, he can't do that. God's in control. God is in control, but sure he can. Sure the enemy can still kill, try to steal, kill, and destroy from God. Every time he takes ground on this earth, he takes ground that belongs to God. Every time he kills another who loses their soul, he steals one of God's creations. And you say, well, what can I do about that? That's not my responsibility. And no, it is your responsibility. If you're truly saved, it is your responsibility. And let me tell you why. Because God has chosen to use us on this earth as vessels through which he engages the forces of evil in the battles of this life. Again, he's not asking you to strap up with a literal sword or a literal shield to fight your enemy. Instead, he's asking you to clothe yourself spiritually in his power so he can give you victory in this life. So you can, so, so you can be of use to him. Real quick, let's go to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 4. Yeah, Proverbs 25, verse 4. Because <laughs> I'm talking about the fact that God is doing something on this earth right now, a bigger plan of God. And I'm talking about you personally, me personally. As he's removing these things from our life, he's preparing us to be vessels for the bigger picture of the war that he's engaged in with the forces of evil. Because he wants to use you and I as vessels... That's why the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has foreordained or preplanned for us to walk in. That's the whole point in understanding the truth of the gospel that he would change us on the inside so that he can move through us. But look what this word says right here. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 4. And let me just explain it to you a little bit. Take away the dross from the silver. What is the word dross? It's, you could look at it like pollutants. You could look at it like pieces of metal that are in silver that are unprecious pieces of metal. It could be various types of metal that are embedded deep within the silver or other elements that make the silver impure. It's dross. It's extra weight. It's things that don't belong there. And there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. That's a little bit difficult in the King James to understand. But if you have a different translation, you know that the word being used right there for finer is refiner. So what is the concept here? The concept is when you've got a block of silver that the refiner wants to make a vessel for himself. He's going to heat that block of silver up to get it hot enough. To where all the impurities rise to the top and he's going to skim it off. And he's going to let that heat work on it a little bit more so that the dross, the impurities come back up to the top. So that he can skim it off. And he can keep on doing that and he skims it off. Until what they say is, is that finally the refiner could see his own reflection in the molten silver. And then he knew at that point that that was a metal that was worthy for him to create a vessel that he could use. For himself. That's the process of what we're talking about here. That's the process of what I introduced to you. That you are not wrestling against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And you are engaging things upon this earth. And the enemy is trying to blind you. Get the stronghold on you. To gouge your eyes out. To make you be blind spiritually. So that you cannot see the big picture of God. That God wants to use you and create a vessel in you. So that he can flow through you. So that he can engage the battles of the enemy upon this earth 
through you because God's got a bigger plan going on. And I'm here to tell you that the enemy, he's full of trickery. He's full of deceit. And next week, when we get started, point number one is God's in a battle even with the spirit of Antichrist. He's in a battle with the spirit of Antichrist. There have been through the ages of the word of God types of the Antichrist. There's a system of the Antichrist that's preparing itself in war against God. There's going to be a literal Antichrist. I got good news to you, though. I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to go ahead and tell you the end of the story before we even get into it. God won it all. Amen. God won. Game over. He has already defeated the principalities and powers. He has already been given the victory, but he has allowed you and I to stay upon this earth. And to be conformed into the image of Christ because he has chosen to use you and I. He has chosen to allow us to be part of the battle. He has chosen to allow you and I to be vessels made for use in the master's hand. I don't know how that affects you, but for me, that encourages me to know that God, he wants to allow me to be a vessel of honor. He's given me that opportunity. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. I know a lot was said, but I pray, Lord God, for each and every person that would hear this message, that you would make them realize if they don't know you, that that's the first step that they need to do. They need to get to know you, Lord. They need to invite you into their heart right now. They need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin and rose from the dead and in victory because the resurrection is proof that he paid for every sin and that when we put our faith in that, hallelujah, we're forgiven of sin. Holy Spirit, right now, just right now, if that is you, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to minister to their hearts and that they would say, come in, Jesus. Come in. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin and wash me white as snow. Let your resurrection power and life enter in on the inside of me. Your word says that you seal those that have believed upon the Christ with your Holy Spirit. Seal them now, Lord, if they have believed upon your word, oh, Lord God. Save them radically, Lord God, and begin to do a work on the inside of their hearts. Do a work on the inside of all of your people's hearts, Lord God. Breathe fresh and anew upon your church, oh Lord God. Make us vessels ready to go to battle for you, Lord God. Teach us your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Join us on Wednesday night. Thank you and amen.